<laughs> That's an I want a wig. I know it feels warm. It looks like cozy. I bet my Very catchy, huh? Yeah, it yeah, is. It is. Mary, oh. Mary, the name, or Mary the name? Um, Mary, Mary, M A R R Y. Pardon me. M A R R Y. M I R. No, I know, but is it? Yes. Does it mean M E R R Y, Mary? Yeah. Okay. E last means last. Okay. Yeah. Joyful. Now this was difficult. Few, few birds. Or birds. Birds like from the German Vogel. Okay. Fugulous. Fugulous. And song. Is song. Is, is, oh, is song. song. Oh, bird song. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's summer. I said like the bird song. Ock is but. Oh. oh. New is now. But now. Ah. Pieces of it. Is nears. Nehe oh. is nears. Nehe. Nears. And this is weather strong. That's fierce weather. Right. Weather strong. Oh. What long is how long? Okay. And we'll all remember this. Ick is I. Well, Mickel. Mickel. Well, Mickel. Very much. It's really see the German. I yeah, 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 yeah. Sorich. Soro. Yeah. Sorich. Mourn. Yeah. And uh, from my research, there's various ways of saying this, so there's no hard and fast. And you may find some of your background comes out, you know, with that old uh, English, some French, some German. So it's, I'll read it out in the way that I sound out. Mary, it is while summary with, summary last with fugulous song. Ach, me near it, wind is blast and weather strong. A hey, A, hey, what is the nick so long? And ich with well nick wrong. Sorech and murech and fast. Oh. Is this is the end of summer song? Uh huh. Oh, okay. Now, this is one of the first songs that they found and revived. Ah. The oldest English song. Big, right? Isn't it lovely? Yeah. yeah. I wonder if I could, uh, do you want to hold the... It's you back. Sonnet 108, Shakespeare. What's in the brain that ain't my character? What's in the brain that ain't my character? Which hath not figured to thee my true spirit? What's new to speak? What now to register that may express my love for thy dear merit? Nothing, sweet boy, but yet like prayers divine, I must each day say o'er oh, the very same. Counting no old things old, thou mine, I thine. Even as when first I hallowed thy first name, so that eternal love is love's fresh taste, weighs not the dust and injury of age. Nor gives to necessary wrinkles place, but makes antiquity for I his page, finding a first conceit of love fair bread, 
where time and outward form would show it dead. Uh, no. Okay. All right. Hi there, everybody. Um, I last week I had the opportunity to go out with some um, three carrier elders, and um, we went to up where I am in Fort Saint James. They have there's a trail. It's like I guess it, there's several names. Like one is they call it the Grease Trail, but it's like in their language, it's the Nayanwete, and it's like the 10,000 year old trail that connected like the center of the province to all the north regions and it's a walking trail. So it was awesome. We went out on there and uh, we did plant identification and checked out like, because I knew the plants down here, I would, you know, right up until now, it's been a year and a half, I've been looking on my own, you know, and sort of exploring because I know the plants, but I hadn't known where to go exactly. I needed that door to open sort of, hey? And there are, and so I connect to these people. They showed me all the plants that I knew from down there, down here, are actually up there. And the quality, the difference, like the weather, like the medicinal feel of it and the flavors and stuff like that, like it's because of the environment, they feel like really strong, like because it gets like 40 below there and stuff. So it just affects things differently, kind of. So it's been really fun to, because we did harvest them and you know sort of like I you know they're they do a lot with trees spruce is a really important plant a tree up there so um you know like using the bark and the boughs and stuff like that so yeah we you know went through all of it we picked and what was one interesting thing about that during COVID up north there they um the guy that I was out with because he's sort of known as the plant guy there they uh he made a bunch of them got together and they harvested a bunch of uh, spruce bark and they made formulas that they made available for people at the clinic in Fort St. James. Wow. So people would come to the clinic and get the spruce because it's super good for the lungs. It was during the COVID time and stuff. Oh, wow. So that was kind of interesting to sort of uh, be working in an environment where that is sort of blending a little bit like the cultural sort of medicine from the gr land there is infiltrated kind of this whole you know medical system how we you know rolled it out like you know so it's sort of changing there's a little bit of blending there and open-mindedness that's super interesting even in the clinic that I work at people are really open to it like nurses and doctors and stuff like that they're asking about you know alternative medicine stuff so it's been interesting to kind of have that open and that was just like in the last little bit so now I'm feeling like you know once you meet the one person in a small community then oh that person knows that person and then that person that I knew over here knows those people and then you start kind of getting to feel like how because that's the other thing like how do you get to know a community eh? like how do you do it you know actually so it's been really a nice organic kind of uh, grassroots sort of way it's been happening. It's been just delightful to be out there and having that opportunity. So, yeah. Sounds lovely. Yeah. Thank, you. Right. Thank you. So we've touched on a subject that is something we're, we're working through as settlers, people that arrive from elsewhere, settled here in Canada. There is a difference between us and the people who've lived here for 10,000 years. That is a long time to be, to, to have lived here. It, you, the land, you, those people who lived here for 10,000 years and made the trails and hunted for, you know, for food and foraged and formed societies and networks. And it was, it, it was very sophisticated their exchanges they had government and they had law not it is a different form but they still it was a structured society it was a culture and uh, a lot of technology involved with uh, the plants using the plants the the silix people in the okanagan valley recognized 500 different kinds of plants and they could identify seven different kinds of Saskatoon berry bushes where botanists can only, I think it's only three, you know, so they, they, they had a, a scientific uh, eye, like a way of, of 
noticing the detail of course they did you know and so on the one hand now we're, so we're beginning to recognize that there was this in some cases it's, it's been carried on thankfully but language culture understanding is sophistication and this flies directly against the view that we were all brought up with but that they were primitive people and the sense of their being that view of them being primitive is what justified the colonization so and this is and not just primitive in terms of lifestyle but in terms of morals and ethics and and you know the savages and and this was a story that you know imperialism was built on it's kind of justified that kind of you know greedy expansionism and and so now we're you know ca caught between the two worlds and, and the understandings they're starting to merge a little bit where we're seeing that there's possibilities beyond our Western understanding, our philosophy of life, our culture, the way we govern, um, you know, the way we approach nature, our, our understanding of science. Um, you know, there are so many questions because, you know, the, all the environmental issues. And so there's a, an attractiveness in the First Nations worldview and and culture and arrangement, the relationship they had with nature. And it's easy to romanticize that, which really doesn't serve any purpose at all, but to actually go, well, recognize that this was another kind of knowledge, a deep knowledge built over, you know, 10,000 years of relationship with the land. And so there's a lot to learn there. And I think that this is the way to move forward in our, you know, coming, our reconciliation, our sense of just appreciation and interest, like genuine interest in, well, what, what did the First Nations think about living together and deciding, you know, in ethics, uh, balancing the needs of the community with the needs of the individual? Well, so there's a lot there that we completely missed and we didn't even recognize it. We didn't know how to ask. We just assumed that they're primitive people and we have this highly evolved, you know, legal system and jurisprudence and educational system. So there's a lot that I think can be dismantled, a lot of prejudices that can be dismantled as we you know, want to sort of learn together or open our eyes and listen to these stories. And it feels like a, I think a coming home in some sense, because a part of us has always uh, wanted that, you know, that more natural connection with the earth and a different feeling about our institutions. So this is very far reaching where we are now in society and also the interesting thing about it and this is the really interesting thing i think is that a lot of you know what happens in the history of humanity in some way it's like there's a thought experiment going on you know suppose we take people who have this sort of lifestyle this is what they're doing this is how they're living they've been there for a long time then you take these other people who think they know everything but they have a lot more technology and they're gonna they're gonna come in and they're gonna want to take all that and then they're gonna blast those other people and kind of almost destroy their culture but not type the, the people with whose cultures almost destroyed they still want to come up and have a voice and those people realize they need what they say and so you know in a way it's like you know people being and put in different situations well how do you work through it like that's really what we're always learning as humanity it's just all these different situations that we're in uh, and so there has been this that's you know like feel you know so full of conflict and opposition and resistance and lots of negativity negativity you know burning away rolling away negativity but then you know that's uh, sort of the human process is to sort of grow and develop and learn and look for what's possible.
on the horizon and what arises out of it and, and how do we do it? Like, how do we actually do it? This is the really interesting thing. How do we actually move ahead together, deal with all the negativity and the emotions and embrace and, and uh, how do we see the world? How do we see it becoming? And just to be really open about this is something that we haven't done before and now we want to do it. So it's all right. It's good. It's part of being here on the planet together. Well, it applies to quite a bit of what I heard from you both, so that's why I'm jumping in. I have supported a club up north, the Chaco, which was floundering because of COVID, and it was the last remaining club from Prince George out to Prince Rupert. So for the past two and a half years, I have ideally increased their membership and the vision was to include First Nations people because Laurel and I both know that that program gives people the opportunity to express who they are and what they want others to know about them. And you can forget all about your past or you can weave it in, whatever, but it's like you write your own story now and the education sort of gives you tips on how to proceed and there's built-in ideas of how to be engaging, how to be persuasive, how to really make your dreams come true basically. And Laurel has been a coach for the last year and a half up there and I've been asked now to be the area director of that club as well as a few in Quenelle, Williams Lake, Prince George. I was the area director like Laurel for the Sunshine Coast. We have that foundation. And it's just that it's quite a bit of work. And I've got four clubs happening locally. But it does give one a credit if we want to pursue other avenues later on. So it is pretty neat because I was asked, I love that. Two, I see the director team are really hot, top-notch people. And it had crossed my mind that I'd like to do something like that. I wasn't quite sure what it was. But I also think that Laura would be awesome doing this. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I'm presenting it, because mm. Laura, with that vision of, you know, not that Toastmasters, I'm not saying is the solution, but communication and connection, we both agree, is so powerful. And we would probably tag team anyway if we're doing something like that up there. Mm. Um, but it, we've had a few First Nations join and then leave. We realize the program might have some limitations because it's a Western view. However, that's part of the excitement because mm. if we are moving together, it's nice to share both styles. And we certainly learn from the First Nations that it takes a little time for them to kind of process, typically, uh, from what I've learned, but that's all changing now with social media. Everybody's sort of engaged in quick responses and dialogue, and so I think social media has been a tremendous blue. Um, I know when I was working and we put on a clinic, the First Nations group locally would just announce it on their social media and people would come. It's very exciting. And so the question that you posed, Laurel, how to go about doing this kind of thing, it is called community development. It is called um, collaborating with, with all the players. It is called um, listening and learning and planning some kind of milestones but not being so totally invested in outcomes. It is leadership. A quiet, gentle, like you mentioned the other night, gentle leadership that is of being of service. It's got its roots, that, that service leadership in the 70s. There was a concept, it started out, um, I think it was um, not service leadership, but servant leadership. And it had a Christian kind of base. I think it was the Quakers that started it. And it evolved, and I noticed it in Toastmasters. 
they called it service leadership, but of course I knew the roots, so mm -hmm. it was fascinating to me. And it's all about connecting and respecting and honoring. So I think that was the missing piece with the colonization, that respecting and honoring the people that were there first. And there is still a chance to demonstrate that, but it does take a while. <laughs> For trust to be regained. So thank you for giving me a platform. Mm, that's great. <laughs> that's really, really. After the Bath by Edith Weaver. Clothed in nature's raiment, they stood before the fire, aged five and seven, to look for fairies and elves that danced with the flame within the flames. A silence of contentment. Then suddenly one spoke in eager tone. You see God on the fire. Oh no. The other gaily laughed. God doesn't live in the fire. Besides, he would get burned. I see God in the fire. Still that high note of security within the childish voice, unmoved by worldly logic. And what does God in the fire? I asked, the while I wondered. He laughs and beckons to me with all his shiny fingers. He dances up and down and hides, leaps again and leaps. He's played games. He's playing games of make-believe like us. Now he's a tree in the wind. Now a fluttering leaf. Now a galloping horse on the plain. And now a lovely house, light with many, many pointed chimneys. Mother, isn't God in the fire? And marveling at her inborn faith, I answered, my child, if he were not there, the fire would not burn. Here it is when the summer last with all the song. Och, do nay have wind as blast and weight as strong. Hey, what this nicht is long, and ich with well nichel wrong. Sorge morning fast, sorge morning fast.